when your fine, upstanding local car dealer tells you it's going to be April or maybe even May before he can supply you that brand new car of your dreams, he's probably not lying. And that's got to be a first for car dealers using actual honesty, just goes to show you how grim things are on the showroom floor right now. They're being forced to deploy the truth. For a car dealer, this is kind of like fixing bayonets. It's that desperate. So, coming up, here's the real reason why new cars are in such short supply right now. I'm John Cadogan from AutoExpert.com.au and I get new cars cheap for buyers here in Australia. Website for that, obviously, or you can just click the car that's up there, I think, on screen now, wherever. Stock shortages are rife across the entire new car market today. It's a salient feature globally, not just here in Shitsville. This is an indirect knock-on effect of COVID-19 and companies like Volkswagen, GM and Stellantis, which is, of course, the latest freak show abomination of automotive amalgamation. <laughs> Companies such as these have found themselves with their wedding vegetables dangling inelegantly out in public, again, metaphorically, because they made a bunch of bad logistics and risk management decisions dating back more than a decade. Oopsie-daisy. Exactly what's occurred in just a sec. But first, this video is sponsored by Olight. And Olight, of course, manufactures some of the best flashlights that money can buy, meaning they're tough, durable, and bright. And unlike a brand new car, you can actually buy a brand new Olight right now. So that's kind of amazing. Some of you apparently want to call these implements of portable brilliance torches. And I'm okay with that. Like, hey, live and let live, dude. I am happy for you to call them whatever you want after due consideration. Just decide for yourself, dude. And feel free to be as right as me on this and call them flashlights or as wrong as the average torch advocate. Because if nothing else, I <laughs> think you'd agree, I'm all about the equality. You can freeze an Olight, you can drop it on concrete and then even beat a werewolf to death with one, frankly. Which is a neat trick because I'm not sure that werewolves are technically alive. They're probably only partly alive, kind of like the brain of your average politician. But you get the idea, okay? They're tough things. And frankly, who hasn't needed to bludgeon an undead predator to death with a frozen flashlight from time to time? Like, we've all been there. Olight Australia is actually having a flash sale from 8pm tonight, fortuitously enough. Tonight, meaning 28th of January, and that's going to run all the way through until midnight on the 29th, which is why you should subscribe and hit the bell notification icon thingo so you get notified of such things in a timely fashion. And if you buy the virtual lightsaber here that we call the Warrior X Turbo, and I certainly hope you are blind now because I normally am when I do these reports. It's awesome for long-range search and signalling this thing, for boating and off-roading and hunting and camping and fishing and things of that nature. If you do that, you will also get an i3T everyday carry flashlight for free. And also the i5T flashlight from Olight is available for up to 35% off. Links in the description for all of that. My personal preferences, the Olight Warrior Mini, a pint-size punch-packing powerhouse, which is virtually blinding as well, and you can carry it all day and not even know it's in your pocket. And then, every time out there in the street, there is an infestation of zombies. I carry the M2R Pro Warrior because this is awesome for dealing with these pesky infestations of that nature. And I'm sure you've seen enough movies of that to know what I'm talking about. 10% off the rest of the Olight range now and outside the flash sale if you just use the code AEJC10, plus the link in the description for that. There are at least a dozen major car makers who have been forced to wind back production because they just can't get the right computer chips, which control virtually everything in a modern car, from headlamps and stability control to the powertrain, the steering, and of course, the infotainment and security systems. It might actually be a shorter list to detail the things that are not computer chip controlled in a modern car. 
Global lockdowns have been a real plus for the sales of things like laptops and TVs and gaming consoles, unsurprisingly. I mean, we're all doing it from home these days, right? And we're going to be doing it from home for the foreseeable future, many of us. Anyway, you're allegedly working from home right now, most probably busting your ass for the boss watching this video. <laughs> working your eyeballs to the friggin' bone, which is anatomically impossible, of course, but metaphorically accurate, and that's important. So well done, dude. I approve of your conduct. It's called research. At least this is what you should tell the boss if you are bailed up on this issue. Demand for computer chips has therefore surged globally, and car makers just don't wield that much demand-based clout in this industrial niche because only about 10% of semiconductor manufacturing capacity globally is devoted to automotive components. So this really is the kind of battle between David of car makers versus the Goliath of consumer electronics giants, with car makers not exactly in any position at all to exercise a great deal of leverage. The new boss of Stellantis, Carlos Tavares, has had a most entertaining tantrum on this recently in front of a reporter from the Brexit Stani Financial Times newspaper. I am here to protect the fact that my company is treated fairly. I will look for all possible solutions. If I need to, I will fight back. It's we, dude, we. The regal plural. You are, after all, a king now. We shall fight back. We shall fight on the beaches, on the seas and oceans, whatever the cost may be, with growing confidence and growing strength. Like, if you're going to do something, dude, do it like Winston Churchill. Except twerking. He was quite bad at that, if memory serves. Otherwise, this is a maxim to live by. Do it like Churchill. Yes. What Mr. Tavares was really saying here, as far as I can infer, is that there's essentially nothing he can do except, of course, turn this unfortunate situation into a somewhat self-aggrandizing PR opportunity. <laughs> and just hope that the reporter is too dumb to notice. Hey, they usually are. What he's not saying here is that demand for computer chips has simply exceeded supply, and the kinds of computer chips used in cars are not all that profitable if you run your country's local chip shop. Computer chip manufacturers, some of whom you've heard of, like Intel, and some of whom you've probably not, like Taiwan's TSMC and China's Semiconductor Manufacturing International Corp., they've therefore shifted supply to somewhat more profitable areas, such as supplying the chips for server farms and 5G networks and cutting-edge gaming consoles, because there's money to be made in them thar hills. Compounding this... The Orange Troll's recent sanctions against China haven't exactly helped Tantrum Boy from the ghost of Fiat Chrysler or other US car makers. Plus, the car industry generally was in a downturn prior to COVID, okay? And many car makers had already throttled back their computer chip orders. So there's that. Those that did not do this, okay, including Toyota and Hyundai, are in a comparatively strong supply position right now. And they are, of course, number one and three in global car making, respectively, last time I looked. That's according to the International Organization of Motor Vehicle Manufacturers for 2017. Number two, ironically, is, of course, my good friends at Volkswagen. Number two. I don't know about you, but... Ever since 2015, I've strongly associated Volkswagen with number twos. I'm certainly not the only person who must find this ranking of theirs serendipitously ironic. Anyway, the Wolfsburg-based winner of the 2015 Platinum Poopy Award for global emissions cheating does find itself ever so slightly with its nuts in a vice during this computer chip crisis. And I know that most squirrels must hate that. I can't imagine it being pleasant at all, experience-wise, except perhaps if you're a dominatrix. But it's been so unpleasant for Volkswagen, apparently, that Peter Altmaier, Germany's business minister, wrote to his opposite number in Taiwan recently, Wang Meihua, begging her for intergovernmental computer chip charity. And that's always dignified. Mr Altmaier's impossibly entertaining argument here, according to the Financial Times, 
was that Taiwan's chip manufacturing giant, TSMC, should prioritise German automotive microchip production because a speedy recovery for the German economy was good for the world. Which I... <coughs> I think you'd agree is a pretty friggin' altruistic reason. Like, hey, Ms. Wang, don't do it for us. Do it for the world. Apparently, Mr. Altmaier made this argument with a completely straight face. Hashtag respect. That's amazing in the domain of self-control. You've just seen me not be able to do that, and I thought I was pretty good at that, frankly. It's worth remembering that car makers are not victims in all of this, not at all. They are absolutely the architects of their own vulnerability to supply chain instability. They even engineered in the instability into this process. COVID might have pushed the first domino right over, but car makers went out and lined them all up well friggin' ahead of time. See, Car makers don't actually hold any component inventory anymore. All of the parts arrive at every factory just in time to make every car. They even call this process just-in-time manufacturing, which is fine, provided you can guarantee the supply of every part. But a car's got, I don't know, ballpark 10,000 parts, and if just one of those parts cannot be supplied, you don't actually get to make that car and your production line basically grinds to a halt inconveniently. And we've seen this happen before, okay? When the earthquake and tsunami trashed Fukushima in, what was it, like 2011, a key supplier of a critical component of automotive paint got trashed and many colours were unavailable globally for months. The plant was operated by Merck, the M-E-R-C-K one, in Onohama near the nuclear power station, all right? And it made this pigment you've never heard of and neither had I called Zerulic. This was the only place in the world that made this precursor to glittery, shiny goodness and its closure restricted automotive paint supplies globally for months. Red and black, in particular, were like dreaming the impossible friggin' dream back then. So it's not as if there was no precedent for supply chain instability. Like, there's your textbook example. Plus, car makers, being the emphatic tight asses they generally are commercially, have enthusiastically screwed chip manufacturers down on price for a great many years now. And the result is that supplying chips to other industries simply became more attractive to the manufacturers of those computer chips. So it's kind of undignified for car makers like Stellantis to play the victim card, at least in my view. Chip makers are, of course, using this perfect storm as a justification to drag car makers to the ankle grabbing room and just jack up the prices. Yeah, so that's kind of entertaining. A little bit of quid pro quo right there. There are some quirks in all of this as well. Now, you might have noticed the launch of the new Kia Carnival Platinum recently, and this is a car that's got everything, almost. Everything except auto wipers. Kind of a glaring omission in a vehicle which is otherwise fully stacked, right? At the launch of the carnival in Australia, the local product planning dude, Roland Rivero, attributed this omission to COVID, okay? And the balance of probability there, this chip shortage could easily be the reason. They can't get some new chip to drive some new auto-wiping black box designed for the carnival, at least for the time being. Computer chip crunch time is probably going to last about six months, according to those whose crystal balls should be attuned to such predictions. So far, about 280,000 cars have been affected by all of this, with the total estimated to rise to about half a million before normal programming is resumed about mid-year, hopefully. Global motor vehicle production is 62 million units-ish, and that was an estimate for 2020. I think that's just cars, okay? So if the car industry had just diversified its component supply chains 
and held about, I don't know, half a percent of annual production worth of parts in critical segments of components, much of this crisis could just have been averted, okay? And you could have your shiny new car now. So well done there, car makers. You complete corporate risk management weasels, essentially just sitting there reaping what you sow and then bitching about it in the media. Do you suppose they're actually gonna learn anything from this lesson? Fukushima clearly never taught them anything. I mean, I'd like to think it will, but this is only because I'm such a glass half full dude. In reality, I think it would be a real mistake to misunderestimate the sheer capacity for hubris and high level incompetence in organizations such as Stellantis or Volkswagen. If you would like me to continue shining a light on this kind of stuff, don't forget the Olight discount code and link in the description. See what I did there? <laughs>